this morning I was thinking as we as Pastor Larry is up here, how important context is in things. Um, Sam was here, and the, the phrase that was stated is, you are leaving now? Good. Now, <laughs> it's all context. Yes, I thought I turned it on. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, and so I, context is so important. It's good that he's leaving because he's going to, to tell about the Gideons and, and their ministry and all. But I just, I heard that phrase and I thought, wow, you know, it's just so important to understand um, the context in that. We are in Romans chapter one. You would turn there. And uh, we've been going through this, this section where in particular, Paul has been emphasizing what has happened in the lives of the Gentiles. And um, we know this actually applies to everyone, but he's going to deal more with the Jewish, uh, with the Jewish community in chapter 2. In verses 18 through 20, we read that man knows that there's a God, and he inherently knows he is, he is made in the image of God. God has, is, has given him uh, evidence uh, for the verse 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. So we see God has made man in his own image. God, man ha is a spiritual being that makes him different from any of the animals uh, that God created. And so we see man's understanding. God, you know, God himself says, man knows, he's without excuse. But then in verses 21 to 23, we see how man chooses to ignore God, chooses to try to put the idea of God down to, uh, you know, professing themselves to be, uh, they, because, verse 21, because that when they knew, knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image, and, uh, you know, we see they, they sought to ignore God. I think one of the classic examples of somebody that would fit this way, that would fit the idea of um, professing themselves to, to be wise, they became fools, is Richard Lewontin. He is a professor of zoological biology, which is the term for evolution, essentially. Um, at, at, uh, he was professor, I believe it was at Harvard, I'd have to see it, or Dartmouth, one of, the, one of those colleges. And he made this statement that he would rather believe the absurd or the impossible than allow a divine foot in the door. And so he basically came right out and said, I am a Romans 122 person. I would rather believe that which is absurd, that which is impossible, than believe in God. And you see, that's, that, is, that is where so many people are today. They are believing that which is absurd. It's interesting because in verse 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world, in other words, from the beginning of time, but I think it's also very interesting that here creation is specifically mentioned. Psalm 19 tells us how creation declares the glory of God. And yet what is the attempt in the naturalistic, ungodly, scientific world today. The world started as a, a big bang. Okay, and when you push it farther, well, where did the stuff come that created the big bang? Well, you know, it came from nothing. So something came from nothing, okay, is what has to be believed. And now what you've got is you've got some physicists who are trying to argue, but there were actually like subatomic particles and little things like that, and I won't get into all that, but then immediately, as soon as they say that, it's not nothing anymore. So now there's something else. Well, where did those somethings come from? You know, and, and you can take it back. It's the same idea. How did life begin on earth? Okay, and, and, and the, the issue you have is there's no explanation. Uh, the, the, the technical term is abiogenesis. How did life begin from non-living material? And the fact is, there is no evidence anywhere of any nature that says that in any way life can come from non-living material. 
And so now what you have is you have some scientists, and these are noted scientists, now world, world known, world renowned scientists, who are saying, well, life came from aliens. Okay, now, you know, and then, and then they feel very comfortable with that. They, they feel like, oh, well, now I've explained where life on earth came from. Okay, where the aliens come from. You know, what, what they're doing is they're just removing things a step farther away so they don't have to explain it because there is no explanation outside of God as to how we, how creation, and in particular man, came into being. And so what happens is, professing themselves to be wise, I mean, these are PhDs who are known for the papers, that the peer-reviewed papers they put out, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, people like that, who, set, who, who present themselves as being wise, and yet when you hear some of the things they say, I was reading an article, a da I believe Danish scientist, PhD, said that our faces, he is now, he is, he is, he is proposing the idea that our faces came from fish. This was a, I read it, this was a legitimate article. This is not like a parody. This was not on Babylonian B, okay? <laughs> this was a legitimate article. You read some of the things that scientists are saying about creation and how they're trying to explain it. And you see, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Because they will, why? Because they will not accept the existence of God. And by the way, refusal to accept the existence of God does not mean God isn't there. Some people think, well, if I don't believe he's there, he's not there. No, he's there whether you believe it or not. It'd be kind of like in war, somebody shoots at you and you say, I don't believe that bullet's real. Well, you know, it's going to have an impact whether you believe it or not. Okay, and the fact is, whether you believe in God or not doesn't change the fact that God is there. He created the world. He created each individual. And so we see man, knew, man knows God's there, but then he chooses and seeks to ignore God. And then as we were reading last week, verses 24 to 27, he then lives apart from God. And we see what happens when he lives apart from God. He basically, if you could really say in verses 21 to 23, as, as verse 23 particularly says, he makes the creature the idol. He worships the creature. Well, going from idolatry to, idolatry to, immora, immor, to immorality is just one step. Once you've left God and you've put him behind, you can behave however you want, basically. In fact, there are some who, there are some atheists who have specifically said, I don't want to believe in God because if I do believe in him, I can't live the way I, I, I want to live. So, I mean, this is, this is recognized. And so what happens is in verses 24 to 27, we read specifically that they go over to their, they burn in their own lusts, they have their own desires. And I mean, what is described very, here, very clearly here is the sin of homosexuality. Now, one of the questions that I have when I read something like this is, why did God choose this sin to illustrate? There are a number of, I mean, any sin would lead this way. Why did he choose this? Well, I think for one, for one reason, it is because it is completely opposite of God's creation and the way he created man. God's creation and his plan, one man, one woman, for life. That's the relationship. Okay. This is completely opposite of that. I think that's one reason. I believe another reason we find in verses 24 and 26, where he says, verse 24, wherefore God also gave them up to the uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts. He basically just says he stepped back and let them have it. Let it, let them go the direction they were planning on going. Verse 26, for this cause, God gave them up to their own vials. It really means he just permitted them to go in their own sin. And because of that, then reap the consequences. And this is where I want to pause for a moment. I think one of the reasons that this sin is chosen is because of the significant consequences to those who participate in this sin. Um, I found there, there's a, it's interesting because this was actually published at the National Institute of Health, which you don't think of uh, I'd be going from this, but there was a, there was a, a study done, the effects of homosexuality on public health and social order. And it was by uh, three people. 
uh, P. Cameron, K. Cameron, and, and K. Proctor. This was done in the late 80s. I'm just going to read basically the, the synopsis of this. Bisexuals, homosexuals, about 4% of the sample, which is about the national average, compared to homosexuals. Here, more free, one, more frequently expose themselves to biological hazards, and I'm not going to go into the specifics. Expose themselves to more people. In other words, they had relationships with more, more people. More promiscuous is the way we would probably put it. More frequently reported participating in socially disruptive behavior. For example, cheating in marriage, making obscene phone calls. And more frequently reported engaging in socially disruptive activities like criminality, shoplifting, tax cheating, et cetera. The, it's interesting, in Canada, the Gay Lesbian Medical Association describes the following detrimental effects associated with same-sex sexual practice. Higher rates of HIV AIDS, substance abuse, depression, anxiety, hepatitis, sexually transmitted diseases, certain cancers, alcohol abuse, tobacco abuse, eating orders, and obesity. They reported that. The Gay and Lesbian Medical Association report, reported that. In 2009, a Canadian uh, GLBT group, they filed a complaint against the government because the, GL, the Canadian GLBT population had poor statistics for life expectancy, 20 years below the standard. Think about that. Basically, they were saying they have the same life expectancy in Canada as people who lived in the 1870s. And I've got several other ones here, but you get the idea. Now, why do I say this? I say this because I believe one of the reasons God put this here, use this sin, is because there are such devastating consequences to the sin. And what God is saying is this. If you choose to go that way, I will, if you're going to reject me and you're going to put me down and you're going to replace me with worship, by worshiping the creature more than the creator, and you want to go that way, I will let you go. You know, one of, the, one of the things people often say is, why does God send people to hell? God doesn't send people to hell. Hell was created, the lake of fire was created for the, sa for the devil and his angels. People go to hell because they refuse what God does for them, because they choose to go. Now, part of our responsibility, obviously, is to tell people so that they can at least make the choice. But the point is, that's not God's purpose, but that's the consequence. God loves us so much, he does not force us to do what he wants us to do. We are not robots made in his image, but he gives us that free will. Yes? You know how a parent, uh, they, you know, when the child is growing up, they're under their own parent. Right? Mm -hmm. Right. When they become a certain age, you can't force a child to do what you want, right? Right. And, um, and, and you basically say, you know, if you're still living in my house, you have to follow my rules. So either you stay in my house, follow my rules, or you have to leave. Mm -hmm. Right? And I think people nowadays have that idea of God. In other words, they can, okay, I don't want to be under your authority. I, I want to be able to leave your universe, whatever, right, and be in my own universe, you know, because, you know, when it comes to humans, the parents can no longer punish the child, and the child can do whatever they want, or right. as an adult, okay, it's almost like people have that idea, okay, it's, it's, uh, and you have to accept the reality, there's only, there's only God's universe, and something outside of God, that's it, there's only two, there's only like, there's not like three, because there could be God, your universe, and then a, and then this, this universe where you get punished by God. So it's like this, this, it's like they want to have free choices, and I want to be able to go to a choice where I can do what I want and not be punished. And people just don't realize that. that's not reality. It's only two places. Okay, let me re re repeat. I'll kind of summarize for those who are on Zoom. You know, what Phil was saying is, you know, in in our society, of course, in most societies, when you're a child, you're growing up in a family, you have to do the parents have authority to say you do this 
And, you know, so whether you want to make your bed or not, it doesn't matter. You have to make your bed if your parents insist upon it, or there are consequences. But when you get to a certain age, then it's like you become uh, considered an adult, and therefore you don't have to do that anymore, which is why on so many college campuses and the men's dorms, none of the beds are made. But that's, that's a whole other issue. Uh, no, the, re the fact is you get away, and all of a sudden you're saying, now I have freedom. Now I can do whatever I want. And so what a lot of people do is they say, now I have freedom from God. Now I don't have to do what God says. Okay, and, and, and Phil's right. But the problem you have with that analogy is like you're saying there's the possibility of being under God or there's a possibility of living on my, my own. Now, what's interesting is this is a great picture. This is a great prelude to Romans 6 because Romans 6 clearly tells us before you were saved, you didn't have a choice. You were slaves to sin. Now, after you're saved, you have a choice, but you have only one of two choices. You either are obedient to righteousness or you're back in disobedience. The difference between the two is that the, the believer has the choice. But you can't choose to, say, live apart from God. You're either, as Christ said, you're either for him or against him. There's only two states. And so, you know, and, and again, that ties in right here. What man is, uh, what a lot of times what man wants to do is man wants to say, I don't believe in God. I'm not against God, but I'm not for him. You can't take that position. But that's the position they want because why? I believe in, in, a, in a large reason, one of the reasons why they do that is because they understand if you are living opposed to God, there are consequences to that. But when you're living for God, you avoid those consequences. If you don't live the kind of lifestyle that's described here, especially in verses 24 to 27, you're going to avoid so many of these issues. Now, are you, am I saying, well, if you don't do that, you won't have any of those? No, obviously there are other, con these can be consequences for other sins and other things as well. But the fact is, when you participate in this kind of behavior, the worst thing in the world that can happen to you is exactly what is described in verses 24 and in 26. God gave them over. God let them go. The atheist wants to live apart from God, which is actually the very worst thing they can do. The worst thing that can happen for any of us as human beings is for God to say to anyone, you want that? It's yours. Go. I will give you up to your own desires. That is self-destruction. That is destined for self-destruction. Now, the problem is those who are opposed to God don't understand that. Why? Satan has blinded them to the truth. I want to, think, I want to go back to, I'll go just a minute. I want to go back to uh, Genesis chapter three. What was it that Satan did to tempt Eve? There were two things in particular. I mean, there were, there were a number of things, but two things I want to mention. One, doubt God's word. Did God really say that? Two, ignore the consequences. Oh, if, if you eat of that, you won't die. You'll be wise. And that's what Satan is seeking to do to humanity today, to mankind today. Okay, Phil? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm letting you. I'm letting go of you, right? And right. You, you're going to experience bad things. Mm -hmm. right? And then think about what's going to happen during um, uh, the tribulation, right? Where right. The Holy Spirit is, is well is is let go of of our world basically in terms of letting people. Right? Mm -hmm. And how bad? And the Bible talks how bad it's going to be then. Right. And then just imagine hell. Where God is totally, I mean, that is how bad that's going to be. Right. Just, just mind blowing to think about. Yeah, you, you see the stages. Okay, you see the stages. I mean, we are seeing a part of it here, but the Holy Spirit is still acting as a restraining force in the world today, which He will not do during the tribulation. You know, some people say, well, the Holy Spirit leaves the earth. No, the Holy Spirit does not leave the earth. Okay, the Holy Spirit is God, He is omnipotent, He is everywhere. He stops His ministry of a restraining as, as to restraining evil okay he is still calling people to salvation during the tribulation there are millions i believe that are saved okay so it's not a, it's not that but he just it, it's almost as if on a worldwide scale god says to mankind 
I'm giving you up to your own effect, uh, afflic affections now. But here's the second part of what I wanted to look at when we look at this. It is easy for believers to look at this, and I say that because I read a number of articles in studying for this that said this, and I won't quote any of them because I, I well, you'll understand. A number of believers say, see, you get what you deserve, is basically what they say. See, this just shows how vile you are. And my problem with that is this. Where's the love? Where's the love of Christ in that? Yes, God is giving them over. It doesn't say God gleefully gives them over and loves to see what happens to them. God does give them over because they have said, I don't want you, God. He says, okay. Now, in a number of cases, I have read some very, very powerful testimonies of those who were ensnared in homosexuality and found the Lord and came out of it. Doesn't say he gives them up forever. And oftentimes when we experience those consequences, they can draw us to it. But you know, as a Christian community, when we see this and we read these kinds of statistics, I mean, think about it. This kind of behavior will take 20 years off of your life on average. We ought not to be responding like, see, that's what you deserve. We need to be responding, you need the gospel. Because it is in the gospel that you will find the freedom that you are seeking for. We talked about this last week. True freedom does not come from having no rules. There are so many people who believe that. It's that true freedom doesn't come. True freedom comes from knowing where the boundaries are and being able to do whatever you want inside those boundaries. Then you are free. We had the example that was given last week of the children that as long as the fence was up around the yard, they were free to play and they had a great time. You see, there's, there are people who have been blinded by Satan and they believe that true freedom means freedom from God. No, true freedom is freedom through God. And how are they going to know that if we don't get the gospel to them? How are we going to take the gospel to them if we're looking at them going, well, that's what you deserve. What do we deserve? I mean, the only reason we aren't getting what we deserve is because of the love of Christ and the gift of eternal life and the gift of justification and sanctification through him. We didn't do anything to deserve it or earn it. And so we've got to be very careful. This is a horrible, horrible lifestyle that has horrible consequences on people. Now, does it say every person who goes down this route is? No, it doesn't. There will be some who are, are fine, and you say, well, see, that's not necessarily true. No, they just, there are, the consequences go, grow at different levels. John. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, the, the point John's making is right now we're seeing a big split in this area. Some people are saying just accept them as they are. Love is love, I think is the current phrase these days. Uh, you know, and, and, and there are numbers of churches of different denominations that are having support groups for those who are homosexual, that are inviting them in. There are homosexuals who are being appointed as pastors and priests in, in whatever, whatever position that would be. Then there's the other camp that is condemning and says, well, see, this is what you get. This is horrible. And you're just horrible people for going through this. And the fact is, neither one of those are biblical. Each of them has a little bit of biblical truth in them, but they are so imbalanced that they're not biblical. What is the biblical truth? That homosexuality, as is lying, stealing, everything else, these are sins. And that the, the, the cure for that sin is not self-improvement. The way you deal with that sin is through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, his shed blood, his payment for those sins. 
And as believers, we must be so balanced. We must have love. Because without love, we're not going to have an opportunity to, to reach them. But we also have to be presenting a holy, a message of holiness at the same time. What is the purpose of the law? Galatians tells us to bring people to Christ. You know, when, when God says this is what's going to happen if he, when he turns you over to your own lusts, to your own uh, desires, and then we read all these studies that show these are the consequences, we see God's word is absolutely true. And we didn't need this to confirm it, but it, it gives us the opportunity to share with others. Look, what you're doing is hurting yourself. And it's what I was talking about last week. We should be focusing on what is God's best and seeking to encourage people to work that direction. And, you know, so many times salvation is presented basically as what I would call hell insurance. You know, you, you, get, a, you get a keep out of hell card, like, like a monopoly, keep out of jail. That's not, that is one aspect of it. But the primary, and I believe the most important aspect of salvation is that we now have an eternal relationship with God. We become his children. We have the opportunity to serve him, to be his ambassadors. There is so much that comes with salvation. And yet so many times we tend to focus only on, well, it gets rid of this one negative consequence. We've got to understand we should be presenting salvation as a glorious lifetime of serving God, followed by a glorious eternity of being with him. So, yes. Uh, again, uh, you think about it, you know, uh, person, and then we kind of equate, I'm an adult person, and it's almost like we're on the same level as God, you know, and, and then I think we have to remember that Right. And we're uh, uh, him on his terms, not our terms. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. One of the points Phil's making is that we've got to understand our relationship to God. So many people want to treat God as an equal. Yes. Yes. Well, and to me, when we're talking to somebody about salvation, that's what we ought to be emphasizing. As a believer, I have access to God. Through prayer, I can go to him anytime. You know, and if you think about it, think back through your lives, the number of times God has just so clearly answered prayer. You know, you say it's, it's beyond any worldly explanation, any, any earthly explanation. Because it's God who's working. There is so much to having a relationship with God. And what Paul is doing here, Paul is not sitting here writing all this so that he can say, see, you guys are just lousy people and, and you, you should just get out of here. He's writing this because as we go through chapter two, where he, talk, he basically does the same thing with the Jewish people, but he just attacks it from a different perspective. He then gets into chapter three where he says, and see, it's the Jews, it's the Gentiles, all of us fall short of the glory of God. He's doing this all in preparation for presenting Christ, who is the answer to what is happening here. And so we, 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 I want to keep the big picture as well. So what happens with man? Okay, verses 18 through 20, he knows about God. But in verses 21 to 23, he puts down that knowledge. He wants to worship the creature. He wants to, he wants to be God himself. Verses 24 to 27, then when that happens, he turns out, he, he is let go, God gives him over, and he's allowed to basically go his own direction, which then brings us to the end of the chapter, verses 28 through 32, which then means he participates in all those things that are wrong and has no regret, no conscience, no idea of it. Verses 28 through 32, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. I find that to be so interesting because basically what happens is man in his own reasoning and rationale will actually do those things that are harmful to him. He thinks 
that they're good for him, but they're actually harmful to him. And he's, he's given over to that. Being filled, and by the way, that would be us too, without God. We'd be doing those things that are harmful to us. How is it that we're able to live a life in service of God and in doing those things for God and in, and in understanding what is best and what is right for us because of God's word and because of, the, our, because of obedience to God's word, the leading of the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, we're in the same position. Being filled, verse 29, with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, uh, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventor of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who, knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Verse 32 reminds me so much there was a it was a bumper sticker and i don't remember exactly what it said but it had basically the idea um of i'm not afraid to go to hell i'll be with all my friends okay that kind of idea and you say that and, and you go you know that is so sad but that is exactly what verse 32 is saying look at verse 32 again who knowing the judgment of god they know god's there they know the judgment they, but that they which commit such things are worthy of death, here's the bottom line. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them. What is this? Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. I'm going to enjoy this life to the fullest. Why? Because I know afterwards I'm in trouble. Now, there are some who, who try to say, well, there's no afterlife or anything like that. But, you know, verses 18 through 20 tell us they're without excuse. They know. They try to drive it from their mind. Some are more successful than others. But think about the person who's described here. When God gives them over to their own desires, they not only know what's coming, but they enjoy the trip there. You know, it's interesting for those of you who have pets, um, there are times when the pet knows, uh-oh, they're heading to the vet. And they're not excited to get in the car. They're not excited for that trip because they know they're, where they're headed. You know, in that case, the animals have more sense than mankind. Because <laughs> what is God describing here? God is describing a group of people who are headed to hell, who are going to be eternally punished for their sins and are just like having fun on the way there. But we also know that in reality, it's not. I mean, it may be a temporary pleasure, a temporal pleasure. But ultimately, they know what's going on. When we read this, it's easy to look at it and say, see, they get what they deserve. This chapter ought to greatly encourage us to get the word out. When you see someone who doesn't know the Lord, do you see them as someone who's getting what they deserve or someone who is going to live a life without God, who is going to suffer all kinds of consequences without God, and who's going to spend an eternity in the lake of fire without God? You know, we've got to be careful the way we look at this. And we have got to have a love for God, and for those whom God have cre has created. God's love for these people does not change. Yes. I do not in any way, shape, or form see how these can be applied to Christians because it's speaking about those who have rejected God. Now, I will say this, though, as a principle, being a Christian does not remove you from the consequences of sin if you, choose to, if you choose to have that sin as part of your life. But for the Christian, the difference is this. Any sin that's in our life is because we're allowing it there. You know, I talk about Romans 6 a lot. We're going to get there. In, well, that's going to say in a little bit, probably not in a little bit, but we are going to get there. 
Romans 6 makes it clear. We are without, as believers, we are without excuse for any sin. We now have the freedom. You know, some people, they, they view salvation as the freedom to sin. Salvation is the freedom from sin. But Romans 6 says, yes, as believers, there are times we go back. We, we, we go back into that. Yes. You mentioned in the beginning uh, how God sent people to hell. I mean, it's the assumption of that, in that is that everybody wants to go to heaven. And some people have been running from God and Jesus all their lives, so they don't want to go. They don't want to go to hell. That's the true way of it. And it's that. Right. So, Yeah, the whole idea, Phil was talking about the, the statement I made earlier, you know, some people say that how can a loving God send people to hell? I mean, it doesn't send them to hell. But the, the fact is, they don't understand God. They don't understand, you know, they, they think, okay, if I love God, I'll be in heaven. If I oppose God, I'll be in hell. And if I live my own life, I'm just, nothing's going to happen. I won't enjoy the blessings, but I won't enjoy the, I won't have to endure the curses. And, and they don't understand that. They don't understand that they, they can't create their own eternity. Okay, God has made it very clear. And so what does that mean for us? It means it's so important for us to understand that if we are not reaching people with the word of God, we're basically allowing them to go their own way. Now, they may reject it. And if they do, that's their decision. But if we don't tell them, that's our decision. Okay. There are sins of commission, but there are sins of omission. So we need to be, we need to be sharing that. Yes. We want to make sure they're fully informed. We want to make sure they are fully informed. Yes. We want to make sure they, if they're going to make that choice, that's their choice to make. So let them make that choice. And so we see chapter one ends in a very somber tone. Okay. But that's because Paul is laying this foundational argument to the fact that all have come short of the glory of God. Now, then we go to chapter two, and then Paul, in chapter two, Paul is now, especially in verses one through 16, uh, is, is addressing the Jewish people. There are some argument, there's some, some commentators believe he's still addressing, uh, he's still addressing the um, pagans, the, but not the pagans that are described, the Gentiles that are described in verses 18 through 32, but the, the ones you would call moral pagans, the ones that live basically good lives, but they're still not saved. But it doesn't really seem to fit. Uh, it, it doesn't fit in this. And so I, I believe this is written for, uh, to the Jews. Therefore, verse two, beginning in chapter two, verse one, therefore art thou inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest the same thing. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit these things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judges them which do, these, which do such things, and does the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? This initial argument of Paul right here is one reason why I believe that this section is being now is, is written to the Jewish community rather than to the Gentile community. Because who's he talking about? Those that are judging. Well, who are the ones that were judging? The Gentiles were off doing their own thing. It was the Jews that were judging the Gentiles. It was the Jews that were saying, we are God's people. We are better than you. We don't do those terrible things. Or what they would do is they would make up laws that would allow them to do those things under certain conditions and it would still be okay. Uh, one of the things I found very interesting in our, in our trip to Israel several years ago is that there's a wire that's going around the city of Jerusalem. And we were, it was explained to us that that wire represents basically the outside of their home because their home isn't considered the building they live in, but their home is considered the city. Why is that important? Well, because on the Sabbath, there are certain things you cannot do outside your home, but you can do them in your home. So if you're in Jerusalem and you're in your home, now it's okay to do those things on the Sabbath, the distance you can walk and things like that. Now, was that what God intended when he said that? Well, no, that was mankind making rules to fit what they want, but still feel like they are following the laws of God, the rules of God. And so we see here in verses one through three that Paul is saying, okay, now those that are judging 
Those of you that are judging immediately, if you're a judge, you see yourself in a different light than if you are the one being judged. The judge is over those who are being judged. The judge is the righteous one, is the moral one, is the, is the one who is appropriate in all things, looking down on those who are being judged. And of course, if you go back to this time, the, uh, the seats of judgment were elevated seats where the judge was sitting way above those who were being judged. And so what do we see here? Paul says, oh, you that judge, you're in, you're in the same situation. Different, you're, you're in the same situation as, as in being without God and therefore being without hope. Was it, how do you, when you judge another, you judge yourself because you do the same thing. It's okay. And this is why, another reason why I think he's talking to the Jews. You're doing the same basic things the Gentiles are, but you're just acting as judge, so now you think it's okay. And it's not. And so Paul is laying this foundation, verse 4, o dis or, or despiseth thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. I believe a lot of this is referring to Jewish history. The Jewish people throughout much of the scriptures held the position, we are God's people, therefore we're better, and therefore we can do things you can't do. Therefore, it doesn't matter. I think when you look at some of them, especially some of the minor prophets, and you look at what they wrote about, and you look at you know, Malachi, where the Jewish people were offering these sacrifices that were completely inappropriate, that were not fit to be offered to the God of heaven. And yet they offered them, and they're like, well, what are we doing that's wrong? Because there was an inherent pride in being a Jew. There was an inherent pride in saying, we're God's children. We can do what we want. You heathen scum, you're the ones that are in big trouble. And Paul is basically saying here, no, you who judge, you're also being judged. You think because God didn't immediately judge what you did, that what you did was okay. And by the way, that is one of the dangers of sinning and not having immediate consequences, you know, and for the Christian as well. You think you got away with it, and now you're emboldened to keep doing it. You just dig in the hole deeper. But that's another issue. So in verses, in particular, in verses one through four, and as far as I can go today, Paul is starting to now to speak to the Jews. And he's saying, by the way, what I just said about the Gentiles, it applies to you. But he's just using a different tact to present that same truth. Instead of talking about their behavior, he's talking about their heart attitude. Their heart attitude is just as hard toward God. And so we'll pick that up from here. Let's pray. Lord, as we come to you this morning and we read the end of man when man rejects you, it is such a sobering thought. And Lord, I would dare say that every person in this room here now knows somebody who does not know you. And Lord, the question we have to ask, each one of us has to ask ourselves, what have we done to introduce them to you? What have we done to share with them your truth? Yes, we understand. If they hear your truth and they reject, that's their decision. We can't change hearts. Only your word can. But Lord, what if we never share? Help us to recognize the end of man without God. And may it be a sobering thought that directs us to share your truth and your word with others. We thank you, Lord, for all that Christ did for us through his death, burial, and resurrection. We know as a people, we are not justified in thinking that we deserve it. It was done out of his love. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your grace and giving us opportunity to accept that free gift. And may we be part of the mercy and grace you show others as we share your word with others. We thank you for this. Pray you'd be with Pastor Sen this morning in his preaching. Be with us today throughout our worship services, our time together. May we be drawn closer to each other and especially closer to you, closer to the image of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.
Man, one quick announcement here. I hope we got a microphone back again. I failed to mention earlier, it's great to see, thank you for getting in there. It's great to see Zimmerman's here and Art Zimmerman. Great to see him here today. I've been praying for him weekly and daily. Uh, also, I mentioned last week, we still haven't uh, uh, gotten a volunteer yet that we're uh, aware of, but I uh, mentioned last week that uh, Margaret Shickley could use someone to drive her to just drive her to Good Sam's and then pick her up a few hours later. If you could do it one time. Just one time. Let Deb Zimmer, she's here today. So we mentioned that last week. And uh, she actually has that like once every three months. But you just just do it one time for us. We'll see how that goes. And that'd be great. But a simple thing, just to drive Margaret Shipley up to her uh, chemotherapy. And it, you can take care of that because Deb's here today. And just go see her. And uh, that'd be a great blessing for you and for Margaret Shipley as well. Thank you very much. You're dismissed.